one thing with those particular bacteria, uh, Salmonella and Campy and E. coli, um, they're relatively fragile. And by that, I mean, you heat up the litter uh, to like 120 degrees Fahrenheit, 130 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot, but not like super hot, obviously, or, or what people normally think of for compost temperatures. Uh, if you can maintain that temperature for like a day, most of those bacteria will be killed. Um, so from that standpoint, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's beneficial. And I say most, not all. That's the key word. Um, really, if you don't follow, you know, the, you know, three days of compost, turn the litter for another and let it go another two, three days. I mean, then you'll have almost a hundred percent, uh, kill. Otherwise you're looking at like an 80, 90%, which really depending on what you're trying to do might be sufficient. Uh, welcome to the Poultry Podcast Show. Um, I'm Dr. Liz Bovek, and today I'm here with Dr. Ken Macklin. We're going to be talking about some various aspects of his uh, his career and some of the topics he's worked on during that time. But first, I'd love to welcome you to the show. Welcome, Ken. Should I call you Elizabeth or Dr. Oh, Bovek? Yeah, that me? works. I got okay. a lot of names. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. We're happy to have you here for our, our chat today. So like to find out first though, how did you get into poultry? How did you get into the, the industry? That's a good question. And I think my path is a little bit different than a lot of others. Uh, growing up, you know, I grew up uh, essentially a, a far southern suburb of Chicago. No poultry around. There was some agriculture around, uh, row crops where I was at. Uh, I would go visit family members and different family members. You know, they would have essentially yard birds. So... And I only bring that up not necessarily to tell you where I'm from, because that's really irrelevant. But I remember at the time, you know, everyone in the family was saying, oh, you know, you love, because I would always chase the chickens and play with the chickens and handle the eggs <laughs> and the chicks. And, and everyone's like, oh, you're going to grow up and work with chickens. And, you know, of course, when you're a little kid, you don't really think anything of it. And then as I got older, I was like, you know, no, I want to become an engineer, go to school you know, do something completely unrelated to ag. Um, so really, without going into great details, I went to Northern Illinois University uh, for engineering. Um, after some time there, after taking, I'll be honest, it was Calculus three. That's when I decided, you know, I got to do something else. Uh, so I majored in life sciences there after bouncing around my major a few times. And Really unbeknownst to me, because I'm like, well, I'm getting this degree in biology, which you know, what am I going to do for a living? Uh, really unbeknownst to me, uh, one of the faculty members there was this uh, person who you may or may not know, Elizabeth, Dr. Bryles. Probably you don't. I don't. I don't. He, he was. And I'm going to be honest. I was like you, like yourself <laughs> in a lot of ways. I'm like, OK, I could go work on the chicken farm in the biology department with Dr. Bryles as an undergrad. So I had done that and then, uh, you know, spent some time there. I actually did a research project with him my senior year and was uh, an NSF undergraduate fellow, which at the time, you know, I'm like still like, oh, that's neat. But looking back, that was yeah. pretty good honor in a lot of ways. Yes, that's and, amazing. And had, oh, yeah, it was. And I'm, but at the time, I'm like, eh, whatever, I'm just artificially inseminating you know, these hens and just doing all sorts of other stuff. But he was one of the early poultry geneticists. Uh, and before going to Northern Illinois, he worked with DeKalb Genetics, which you know, was a layer, layer genetic company, which is now, you know, the genetics is still around, but they've been bought and sold several times. And got my <clears throat> work with him as an undergraduate and I was finishing up. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go out with this bachelor's degree in life sciences and get a job somewhere. And really, I think it was just coming from a family where, you know, I was a first in my branch, the first person to go to college, my parents did it. So they really weren't much help, I guess. But I'm like, yeah, I'll be able to go out and work in a lab and not saying that you can't with a bachelor's in biology, but it's very hard. 
and those jobs are far yeah. and few and in, in between. Um, but as I was leaving to go work in a gum factory, I won't say the name, Dr. Bryles had offered, he's like, well, you know, if you want to come back and get a master's or a PhD, you know, come, you know, give me a call or, or this is, he didn't, I mean, he was of the age where email was not saying he didn't answer email, but you're better off calling or writing a letter. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so after that. working, putting, and anyone who knows me, if any of my former students, because I've heard this story a gajillion times, putting gum in a box is what I did at this gum factory. And I'm thinking, oh why did I go to college for this? Gum, picking up stacks of gum and putting them in boxes, and pushing the box out for eight plus hours a day. I mean, that was not for me. <laughs> and, see if, and I'm like, I'm going to contact Dr. Bryles and see if I can work on a master's degree with him. So I, I did. And of course, he accepted me. So I went to Northern Illinois, got my master's degree. But even then, I'm like, OK, I'm going to get a master's degree and then I'm going to go work out. I'm going to go work uh, out in the industry, either poultry or, or just life sciences. And a couple things happened. One is Dr. Bryles, he wanted me to stay on for a Ph.D., which, you know, at that time uh, it was encouraged you go elsewhere. So I didn't think I was going to stay there, especially at a smaller school like Northern, though it's a big student body type of school, but not really known for poultry or uh, biology for that matter, or life sciences. Um, so I was like, no, I would like to go somewhere else. Uh, so then it was, gosh, it's pretty bad. I remember all this stuff. I believe it was in poultry science in 1995. It was held up in Edmonton. And I was the only one from my lab group to go there. And I brought a couple posters and it wasn't like today where you have the posters printed out on a big sheet of paper. It was back when you would, you know, print it out on a sheet of paper, on a sheet of paper and, you know, you cut it and you paste it to the uh, backboard and put it up. It was a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. And <laughs> presented a couple posters up there in Edmonton and, you know, had my little two page or whatever resume hanging up on the board and. Uh, you know, a few people had approached me saying, yeah, we'd like you to come here for a Ph.D. Um, in poultry because I was interested in that. Um, but I was one thing I feel about I was recently married and I just needed a break because. Yeah. I, I, just a little rest. Um, and then Dr. Bob Norton at Auburn University, he contacted me or was one of the people that talked to me. And he was a brand new assistant professor there. From uh, He came out of Arkansas. And he's like, yeah, you come on down and, uh, you know, work as a technician and I will let you take classes and work for your PhD. And, and that's uh, how I went that route. But I, I failed to mention, you know, one of the things that Dr. Bryles had told me, and it really stuck with me. And it's something that I share with my students that I've had over the years is, and, and it's going to sound weird. And again, all my students have heard this is like, because I've mentioned to Dr. Bryles that I'd like to go work. And on the human side of medicine. Um, but he was like, do you want to be a little fish in a big pond and probably never or have a hard time not only making a name for yourself, because that's not really what I feel this is about. It's just more about making uh, doing research that's impactful to society as a whole. And I'm not saying that wasn't possible, but it was a lot more challenging when you're one of 100 people working in uh, you know, human genetics or human immunology. And he said, or you can go into agriculture, specifically poultry, and you will be like one of a handful of people in the world working in that particular area. Now, obviously that's, well, that is the area my PhD was in, but that's not the area that I, I um, ended up pursuing afterwards just because you got to go to where the job opportunities are and and funding in a lot of cases, which was a big challenge, of course, uh, back then as well as now. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much how I ended up in a well, while. And even at Auburn, you know, I was going to get my PhD and go work somewhere else. But, you know, I was one of the few fortunate, maybe, I don't know, where I'd receive my PhD, <laughs> receive my PhD and, and, and they hired me on a couple of years after my PhD. It wasn't like right away uh, to be an extension specialist. Uh, and, you know, assistant professor at the time. 
And then the rest is kind of history as far as academics and then research. I, like I mentioned before, I've been kind of all over the place. A worldwide leader in animal nutrition, Adiseo's portfolio of products includes methionine, the full range of vitamins, enzymes, organic selenium, probiotics, mycotoxin management strategies, and palatability products. With such a diverse offering, Adiseo supports its customers with a broad range of expertise, tools, and services to help them maintain a competitive advantage. Adiseo, fueling predictable profits. To learn more, visit Adiseo at www.adiseo.com. When you first joined the, the faculty and the extension team at Auburn, what, what were kind of some of the early projects you worked on and what, what did it morph into? I know the, the landscape has changed so greatly. Um, were you working mostly in broilers? And you know, what did you do? Like The projects must have just changed incredibly over time because the industry is much different already. And they and they truly have. I mean, that's that's a very yeah. good point because I, I look at uh, and it's kind of weird, you know. Each uh, while I was at Auburn, he was an assistant professor, associate professor, professor. It almost seems like what I worked on changed. Uh, it wasn't necessarily that cleanly, but in the end, you know, looking back, and of course, I'm not that far removed from uh, being at Auburn, having been here at Mississippi State for five six months now. But it just seems like between each one of those promotions was a, a certain research I was working on. And really to, to get to your point, the first thing that I had worked on there was litter management and litter. Um, and I can't say I was the very first person, but I know myself and the people there at Auburn, the uh, other extension people that I've worked with, you know, really we advocated for in-house windrow composting. And, oh my gosh, I, it, it's a great, it is great. And, you know, we did the science to prove that it would reduce pathogen load in the litter, not only bacterial, but viral and even impacts like the coccyx and some of the other spore, some of the spore forming bacteria. I mean, it, it was really good, but uh, an extension when you're going out there and trying to tell farmers how to do it when, you know, your version of doing it is like taking a shovel and shoveling litter into a pile. And they're going in there with their tractors and, and, and you know, straight blades and trying to <clears throat> move litter around to get it to work. And I can be honest, early in my career with that particular project or with that um, technology and transferring it out to the industry, I received so many emails and phone calls from people. Have you blinded my chickens? And, you know, my chickens have respiratory issues. And I'm like, well, I always it, I always told them in my talks, it's like, you got to give time, you know, run your fans, blow that ammonia out, add your uh, litter amendment, your acidifying litter amendment, increase the amount that you're adding, you know, don't follow the manufacturer recommendation because it's not enough because you just have this huge ammonia bloom once you break up the, excuse me, that compost pile. Um, that was probably one of the first, things that I'd worked on. And of course, at that, during that time, you know, I looked at a lot of the different litter amendments out there, you know, acidifying litter amendments, which there's, you know, a couple big ones out there, maybe three, I guess I could think about the top of my head, but also looking at alternatives as far as, um, you know, anime, uh, not anime, probably like uh, microbial litter amendments, uh, as well as like other feed through products that could help lower ammonia uh, being produced or generated from the litter uh, with some success with different ones. And, and we've, we've published some and there's a lot that we just like, okay, this really did not work at all. So we'll just not even, we'll make a nice little abstract and present it and talk about it in meetings, uh, you know, more extension type meetings, but you know, not publishing just because it was not too exciting. Yeah, not good. <laughs> well, it didn't work. And, and you know, back then, and I think a lot of us, um, you know, scientists were like, well, it didn't work. So I'm not going to write it up, do no result research and then risk it being rejected from whatever journal we publish it to, uh, which back then I, yeah, but now I'm like publish everything, you know, cause we need to, we got to hear about the no results as well as the good results as far as those things go. Um, and then see, I told you I was going to go down a rabbit hole. So what are your thoughts? So the, the U.S., I know the trends are now, and this might have been influenced by your results, 
the trends are to compost for about a year or so, and then you kind of backfill or you get new litter or whatever, you know, the time period is for the cycle. But in Europe, they usually do new litter every time. So do you see big differences in pol 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 quality, I can't even talk, um, or ammonia production between those two different systems? Like, would you advocate for new litter more often? Or are you a big advocate for composting and, and reusing? Ah, that's the trick question in some ways. <laughs> Uh, and I do honestly believe this, even though, I mean, there's pros and cons to both ways. And, and really in simplistic, at least in my simplistic mind, you know, the pro for changing out uh, between every flock is, you know, you're removing the pathogens or, or whatever you may have in that bedding material. Um, and that's really, it, it does cost more money. Uh, it is more labor intensive, but you do run the risk, you know, if you have, you know, one thing I know we'll be talking about a little bit is salmonella uh, and campylobacter uh, mainly. And we could, eat, I mean, we'll talk a little bit about necrotic rhinitis, I think. But you're removing, physically removing all the litter that may have those pathogens in it. And then, you know, usually there in Europe, they actually sanitize the house because it's cement floor and it's completely different production than what we have here in the States. So, I mean, it's really good at removing those pathogens. However, uh, and, and, and this is why I feel maybe I worked with the U.S. poultry industry too long, but I'm biased perhaps, and I'm not going to say I'm not because I, I, I believe this. You know, there's an advantage to having the built-up litter because even if you win row compost once a year uh, and you keep your litter in there for one year or, you know, 20 years, which isn't unheard of. I mean, it used to be 10, 15 years ago, maybe a few years they might keep the litter in, but now they keep it in way longer. Uh, not only is it save on cost for the producer, um, but, you know, they see advantages to having that built up litter because you do get that kind of that free competitive exclude or competitive exclusion and the good bacteria that are going to uh, where they just generally grow better. Um, uh, you know, and you don't get what they get in Europe. What they call here in the states is the new, uh, you know, new litter syndrome or new house syndrome, where that first uh, flock on new litter, you just don't get the same performance as you do in subsequent flocks. So, I'm a believer in built-up litter. Now, the problem with built-up litter that a lot of people really—it it sounds easy, right? You know, you compost it once a year. You go in after every flock, decake you know, removed all the uh, caked litter quote. I'm ho hopefully everybody knows what cake litter is. Remove the cake litter, uh, let it out a little bit, um, you know, and heat up so that uh, it kind of burns off some of that ammonia. Uh, but you don't really uh, negatively impact, you know, the bacterial populations in there. It, uh, if it's managed correctly is what I'm trying to say. It's great, uh, but oftentimes more with new producers or people who are wanting to take shortcuts, you could make mistakes that are problematic. Like I mentioned before with the blinding of the birds, when people, you know, they're like, well, I'm gonna windrow compost, break up my pile, and then a day or two later place chicks. It's like, no, that's just not good planning or good management on their part. So that's usually the issue. But really to get back to your question, I, I, I believe built up the built up litter system uh, when managed properly is the better way to go. And, and there is ammonia. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. But they can pay. What are some of the key things? You mentioned a few of them in terms of planning ahead and windrowing and then enough time for the uh, ammonia to get out of the system. But what are some of the key things for someone who might need some litter uh, suggestions or, or key points to help them improve their operation? Oh, that's a good question. And I'll try to answer it. I'm going to be honest, I haven't given a litter talk in some time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really haven't. Um, you know, some of the key things, uh, well, there's a few of them, and they're going to sound pretty simplistic if, if farmers are the main people. I mean, talk to your peers, you know, other farmers on what they're doing to manage their litter. Um, and maybe not just the person next door, but, you know, someone who usually has a good you know, good birds or, or you know, good settlement, you know, where they're one of the top people. And then what are they doing? Um, at least from my experience working with growers over the years, I, 
they're going to tell you what they do. You know, there's no secret. You know, they're they're willing to share their their information and knowledge, uh, you know, freely because you know they they understand there's some competition. That's just the nature of the growers' contracts with these different companies. But they also want to help someone out. You know, someone new. So you know, I would talk to their fellow growers, fellow farmers. Um, obviously, you know, have a discussion with some of the service techs that may come by their house or their facilities and talk with them. There's a lot of resources online, um, you know, extension bulletins from places like, you know, here at Mississippi State where I'm at now, Auburn, uh, Georgia. There's some good people there still working in that area. Of course, Texas. Uh, there's a real person up there in Arkansas that they just hired, a former student of mine. So I got to give a little shout out to him, to Zach Williams. Good contact there, as well as NC State. You know, pretty much all the departments that have a poultry science department have information about litter management. And it, it gives you not necessarily, it gives you some of the science, but it gives you more of the big picture. But if you really want to know what, what may work in your the area you're at or um, what they have, I mean, it's, I think it would be better to talk to a, you know, a peer, a fellow uh, poultry farmer, because they'll know what's working for them. Uh, and a lot of this uh, research, if you go to those university sites, is done with pine shavings. And of course, different depending where you're at in the States, you know, like Southern Alabama, they use a lot of pine, not pine, peanut holes. And then there in Arkansas, in, in places, some places here in Mississippi, they use uh, rice holes. A little bit different, you know, because we're talking pine shavings. And we just assume everybody uses pine shavings. Yeah. So, um, so you talked about some of the things that can maybe be beneficial about the built-up litter, or um, maybe things that even can go wrong if it was managed improperly. So, what's your insight about some of the bacteria load and what happens, and what, what you know, how do the birds respond if you've in, improperly composted? Like, is this a salmonella issue waiting to happen? Is it a campy issue waiting to happen? Like. How, how does the how does the bird interact with the litter and then what are the food safety outcomes on the other side that's a big question <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question and that's that's I, I only talk about what I did for my as an assistant professor but we also did look at seminal levels and campy levels uh, when we did the windrow composting stuff um, one thing with those particular bacteria uh, seminal and campy and e coli um, they're relatively fragile. And by that, I mean, you heat up the litter uh, to like 120 degrees Fahrenheit, 130 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot, but not like super hot, obviously, or, or what people normally think of for compost temperatures. Uh, if you can maintain that temperature for like a day, most of those bacteria will be killed. Um, so from that standpoint, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's beneficial. And I say most, not all. That's the key word. Um, really, if you don't follow, you know, the, you know, three days of compost, turn the litter for another, and let it go another two, three days. I mean, then you'll have almost a hundred percent kill. Otherwise, you're looking at like an 80, 90 percent, which really, depending on what you're trying to do, might be sufficient. And, and to clarify what I'm getting at, let's say you have like a coliobacillosis issue. Knocking down 80% of the E. coli that's the problem might be enough, um, but it might not be. Uh, that's why you should do it properly. Um, now that with food safety issue, you know, knocking it down 80% isn't <laughs> uh, enough because, I mean, one thing with those bacteria, kind of like E. coli uh, to a degree, um, they're just going to replicate in those birds. and. Uh, unlike E. coli, which there's going to be an active immune response because those are causing illness. So the birds will be fighting it off or should be. If their immune system is healthy. There's no other stressors. Uh, salmonella and campy are, um, I'm trying to think of the right word. You know, they're, they're oh my gosh, I should know this. Uh, not symbiotic, but they're nor part of the normal microflora that you could find. Comment oh, yeah, commensal. Commensal, yeah. thank you. That's the word. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you don't do uh, composting properly, there's a chance. And, and, you know, let's say the integrator is saying that your farm has salmonella issues. Um, if you don't windrow compost properly, there's a good chance 
uh, at least for that bacteria, that one in Campy could come back. So I, I think in your role as extension, you probably were called out to solve a lot of issues, right? There was probably some education going on, but I know extension agents usually have to be problem solvers. Or are there any problems that were of particular interest that you were able to solve in your role? <laughs> I think at least for me, when I was an extension specialist, uh, I tried to do, and that's why I've kind of covered a lot of different topics over the, over the time that I was at Auburn. Um, I, I always felt it was my job to, to, to help the grower um, and to help the industry, you know, to help the integrator and really in any way or using what, well, first off, you know, what I found interesting, uh, but I wasn't, I didn't feel I should be pigeonholed into like, let's say doing litter the whole time. Um, I, I felt that it was important that I just went out there. So I was like a hot topic extension specialist in some ways okay. on the live Ooh, side. You know, I didn't yeah. feel that I was confined to just doing, you know, litter work because that was, ex that was exciting, but you know, it kind of got for me a little boring. Um, so, you know, that's why I'd also looked at NRI, the chronic enteritis, because that was an issue again, early on when I was an associate professor and we looked at that and did it, feed additives and how they may impact, uh, enteritis development. Um, also, what on the farm can be done to manage it, which of course, you know, litter is a big part of that. So that played in there. Um, you know, we've done some, you know, back then we did some hatchery work, which I've kind of gone back towards uh, before leaving Auburn. And even now as a department, I'm still working with hatcheries because so, I enjoy doing yeah. that sort of stuff. Um, and then, yeah. you know, the salmonella uh, really, you know, I think that's okay. been and I'm not really answering your question, I feel, but, you know, Salmonella has really been <laughs> on what, where I finished up when I made, when I became a full professor, where I started focusing on that, mainly because it's an issue that's been around since forever, essentially. Uh, but it seems like whenever we come up with a new intervention, you know, when I was uh, a young researcher or doing this, you'd always hear about Salmonella typhimurium or Salmonella iteritidis. And those two are still around, but then, you know, new players came up like uh, Heidelberg and Seftenberg and all these other ones. It's like, where, what, what's the role of, of these? Why are they coming around? What, where are they coming from? Um, so I, I received some federal funding, of course, because they're the ones who would find it probably most interesting or who are willing to fund that sort of research where we went out to farms and I'm not the first one to do this, nor will I be the last. And we tried to take a comprehensive approach, um, looking, you know, starting with pullets, going to the breeder farms, uh, going to the hatcheries, going to broiler farms, following, you know, not, we, we didn't follow flocks. We followed farms, following the farms uh, that then went to the processing and, and, and essentially everything in between, like inside the house, outside the house, we collected all sorts of different things, really to see where were these emerging salmonellas coming from. You know, once the industry gets a handle on uh, controlling type of you know, why is, like I mentioned, you know, Heidelberg or one of these other ones cropping up. So really to get back to your question, or at least what I remember of your question, uh, I, I, I just always felt that it was part of my role twofold. Um, one, it was to help the farmer and the company with, with current problems that they're having. Um, you know, it comes to different intervention methods, both on the farm as well as with potentially something in the feed. Uh, but the other thing, too, was also to think ahead. You know, what is the next issue? What's really the question that they're not asking that needs to be answered because it's part of the problem. And, and that's why I mentioned that salmonella uh, it was because so many, you know, they think of, well, if we made our birds against Seftenberg, you know, that'll the problem will be gone. And, and yeah, there's a lot of evidence, a lot of research has been done by people much better than myself, where if you vaccinate against Seftenberg, yeah, Seftenberg will go away, but some other salmonella will creep in and become a problem. And of course it'll cause food safety issues in the final product. So, again, I gave you a convoluted answer, but that was what I yeah. found interesting. I mean, it's we, my lab, yeah. we've done a lot of work in that area, painfully yeah. hard work too. Yeah. In that area. 
Oh my gosh. So the, the salmonella discovery project, if you will, sounds, sounded really interesting. What were kind of the big takeaways? Cause I, I also wonder where some of these other strains come from. Okay. And then I could, I mean, it's interesting. And again, this is not overly original because it's just, reinforces what others have seen, but I feel that ours was more comprehensive as far as our approach. The main, well, a couple different things. Um, as far as where are these different salmonellas are coming from, to me, it seems to be coming from um, insects, the vermin that are just prevalent on our farms. I mean, we it's easy to say, hey, we got a fly control program or we got a litter beetle control program or we have a rodent program but I have never been on a farm where those pests aren't around. So they seem to be what's really transmitting a lot of these. Now, what we do, obviously we can ramp up our intervention strategies, but better yet, let's come up with new ones that are better than um, what's in place now, because obviously, I mean, you know, there's not gonna be a new rodenticide coming around or a new insecticide. I mean, we gotta come up with a better strategy and be it uh, you know, I, I will say this, we did, uh, either be or coming up with new intervention techniques or technologies, the way to go. And a grant that I'm on right now with some people at Auburn entomologists, uh, is just that, you know, we're to come up with a different way for controlling litter beetles, which, I mean, if you've been in a, in a poultry house, uh, I mean, it was just something that was in poultry times or one of those magazines where they talked about. You know, if you go in a poultry house, there's literally like millions of beetles, if not hundreds of millions. There's a lot. Let's leave it at that. It's like, what can we do to better control them? Insecticides are great for a one-time knockdown, but we need something a little bit more longer term. And that's something uh, really without getting it going into great detail, something that we're working on. And it's completely experimental at this point in time. So there's really, you know, there's not much to say other than we hope that it works because um, well, then I'll probably be retiring, I guess, as well as my colleagues, because it'll be a, it, I mean, I don't know if I'll retire, but it'll be definitely be something beneficial to the industry and something that we're excited to be working on. So that's one thing. The other big discovery that's come from this, and see, I'm like, I had two points. One was, those are the main vermin that I, we're, we're finding all these weird salmonellas in their feces or in or, or on their carcasses, like on the fly carcasses and beetle carcasses that we've collected, the carapaces on them. Uh, the other thing is like really uh, to really minimize the spread is at the hatchery because the hatchery is just a, you know, and, and again, not original there, but the hatchery is where if you have one contaminated breeder flock, you know, all those chicks are hatched, they're on a conveyor belt. The same conveyor belt as all the other chicks. So they're all going to be exposed to that. Um, really sanitizing and, and, and maybe even sampling your the flocks beforehand to see which ones are positive. So you can, excuse me, those chicks towards the end would, would be my suggestion. Yeah. Uh, you always think about the vermin or insects or whatever gets into the house, but you forget that they are also potential carriers of things you don't want, including different salmonellas or, or whatever. It's, it's scary that we don't have better control. I mean, you can do your best, but they're so small, they're going to get in. <laughs> yeah, well, they're so small, they're attracted to, you know, the feed that's in there, the feed, as well as obviously the fecal material. I mean, it's like a, it's, you know, it's an oasis. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or a, what's it like? cornucopia of, of, yes. of where these animals and insects where they want to go because it's so much good stuff for them you know perfect habitat yeah. and it's like what yeah. can we do to really prevent it and there is no easy solution at all yeah um, unfortunately so i know there might be some emerging technologies that hopefully will help solve this problem but over the course of your career, have you found anything that really was a game changer for the time? Like, do you know, do the litter amendments really work or is the game changer the management? I mean, there's probably not a silver bullet, but is there something that you really felt like was revolutionary that has really improved 
what happens on the the downstream end in terms of like better composting or less disease that is transmitted to the birds through the litter or the environment? Yeah, that's a good. Well, of course, since you know, you know, I was one of the people that promoted composting is a great te- uh, technology, I guess, for lack of a better word. The litter, the acidifying litter amendments, they definitely have a place uh, more, I feel, for the health of the bird as far as keeping ammonia levels low. Um, they do modulate the bacterial levels to a, a, to a degree. Um, I mean, they'll, they'll be that initial reduction, but you figure when they put litter amendments on, it's only in the top of the litter and you got you know, may have six inches or so or you know, four inches of litter, which everything in there, you know, that bacteria that uh, levels are un- unimpacted or unaffected by these litter amendments. So, but they definitely have a place for controlling ammonia. Like I'd already mentioned wood roll composting is good as far as knocking down bacterial levels. Um, I didn't mention before, it's good for knocking down like overall bacterial levels to like, oh my gosh, I have to remember this stuff, like five or six logs, which is still a lot of bacteria. But so you're looking at, you know, a million bacteria or so, you know, per gram so a little tiny amount there's still a lot of bacteria but that's coming down from uh 10 to the 10 so you're looking at like trillion or more bacteria per gram so i mean there's a significant reduction uh and the bacteria that are mainly impacted are the i mean they're the bacteria that live in the chicken for the most part so that's where you know that's why your e coli's and salmonella's and campion these good bacteria that are in there like the lactobacilli and bifido and whatnot are being um, you know, impacted or re- those numbers reduced. But there's also a lot of bacteria that are environmental that are in there. They could tolerate the heat. Um, you know, they could be spore formers uh, like the Clostridium. And, you know, people always think of Clostridium as being bad and it, it, and they are bad guys. But they're also, you know, commensal bacteria. Thank you for the word again. Commensal bacteria found, <laughs> found in the chicken gut. You know, so, I mean, there's good uh, Clostridia as well. I mean, that's one thing people tend to forget. Really, the, the few bad eggs, so to speak, um, you know, have been adapted to cause disease in, in the animal. And, and most of them are, are just like there to, uh, to chill out and, you know, live and thrive and not yeah. cause damage to in the intestine. <laughs> yeah, just living their best life. <laughs> exactly. Well, the best life that they can in the chicken. So, um, what what has been your experience with how necrotic enteritis has changed over time? I know um, it probably has been impacted by composting and other things, but also the nutrition that we're able and the tools that we have for the bird are so different, even compared to ten years ago. So, kind of, what's your take on necrotic enteritis? Man, another big picture question. Um, <laughs> enteritis. I mean, it's still out there. Uh, I think. As, as poultry scientists, and not just the academics, but those in the industry, you know, the veterinarians, we've got a better handle as far as managing it and, and having, there's other tools out there besides antibiotics that do seem to have uh, efficacy in controlling that particular or, you know, syndrome. <coughs> we've done a lot better with, man, you know, I think with enteritis is really where it comes down to is just better, having a better uh, coccidia control program. And I think companies have gotten more serious as far as managing it. You know, the grower has also gotten better as far as managing, you know, these birds that are on these different, either vaccine or on these chemicals or, uh, you know, if they're allowed to have antibiotics on these ionophore fed birds. And just, it just comes down to management because I, I really think, it, and you kind of alluded to it, you know, what's changed in the past 10, 15 years? Well, 15 years ago, you know, we had bacitracin in the feed and, all the chicks were, when they were in Ovovax, they had genomycin put on the, that little air cell and, you know, Virginia myosin would be commonly used. And, and now with, you know, the majority of the poultry production here in the U.S., we don't do that anymore. Um, so it's really come down to management, uh, you know, of the farm, but also of the veterinary uh, health programs that they have in place to keep those bacteria or the bacteria as well as the parasite. Uh, in check so that you don't have enteritis flaring up. Now, do we still have enteritis in the U.S.? Yes, we do. Uh, and we did 10, 15 years ago. But even 10, 15 years ago, when it started to become an issue here in the U.S., it was nothing like what they saw there in Europe because there it was just like, 
well, we clean out every time and everything. There should be none of these bacteria or these parasites in there. And it's like, well, they're getting in there somehow. And let's be honest, you know, both the oocysts, you know, from coxie as well as perfringents form spores. I mean, they're going to persist unless you mechanically, you know, hose down your facility and, and you know, more than just, you know, you can spray all the detergent you want on there. Those bacteria, uh, those spores and uh, oocysts are going to be like, well, thank you for cleaning me off. You know, I'm ready for the next bird. Um, so I, I think we, we've just gotten better with, with management and, and, and just more aware. Uh, and it really did start with the farmers, I believe, with that. They're the ones who did. And of course, with the nutritionists and the veterinarians and, the, and their programs that they had in place and, and going away from uh, feed ingredients that we know will cause some aggravation in the, of the intestine. Yeah, that's just a big picture overview, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's perfect. Um, I feel like we've been on quite the tour over the last <laughs> half hour or so. So I wanted to know if there was any kind of big points that you wanted to, to hit home <laughs> that we've chatted <laughs> about today. Man, because well, you, you got me thinking about it. You know, one thing is um, it's really dependent who's listening to this. You know, obviously, if it's a grower, um, you know, talk with fellow growers, uh, even if it's a veterinarian, nutritionist, a research scientist, uh, just talk with your colleagues and see what works and what doesn't work. Um, there's always some uh, pig-headed individual out there who, who, who thinks they know it all uh, and may try something different. And hey, more power to them. Just please share with us what, what you did and if it worked or not. Because if it worked, great. If it didn't, you know, then you know, thank you for trying it and, and sharing your experience. So I guess the big picture or the big take home message, if I was to have one, was to listen to your colleagues, um, you know, keep up with with what's going on, uh, not only in your community, but within, in this area overall, because there's a lot of interesting things being performed and new technologies being developed and, and techniques as well. So it's just to be open minded and to listen to people and you know, ask the questions. I, I think that's, that's sage advice. So, <laughs> It's time for our famous three. Natural Biologics is using cutting edge science to dig deeper into the poultry health challenges you face. By gathering scientific evidence, they identify the most effective combinations of natural ingredients that improve animal health. Visit naturalbiologics.com slash poultry to see the newest research in both turkeys and chickens. Before we wrap up here, I'm going to ask you the three questions that we ask all of the guests. Yes, so I'm, I'm excited. Looking, I was going to grab the book and, and bring it here. I, I excited to hear your answers. No, it's all right. So uh, do you have a favorite poultry-related resource or book? Actually, I have two. And, Ooh. <laughs> yeah. One Fire that, away. <laughs> yeah, the one that I like is Diseases of Poultry, which because, you know, I did a lot of health related type issues and it, it's just a good resource. And it's really could get down to nitty gritty as far as the efficacy of different vaccines and treatments. So it's it's a pretty good book. I, I like it. Uh, the other one, which helped me more early on in my commercial, oh my gosh, early on in my extension career, because I did not come from a commercial uh, you know, poultry background was just that commercial poultry, the book. Ah, yeah. Which I'm cool. looking for. I, I know I, I see it up there. Commercial poultry production. I guess that's the title of the book. That's <laughs> a really good reference. Uh, it's dated now. I don't think they've come out with a, a newer edition, but it was very handy <laughs> for like um, more for me, like how much litters being produced per, you know, 100 or 1,000 birds. You know, depending mm. upon the size, and you know, it's just a good resource for just general uh, management issues with with broilers. Yeah. So I got oh, two. Sounds good. More power to you. I I totally get it. I uh, often have uh, trouble picking a favorite anything. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to pick um, a favorite be diseases of poultry. Is that one I, I diseases I, of poultry? Yeah, yeah, that's a good book. Or it's two books set now, but it's still one book. Yeah. What is a favorite non-poultry related book or resource? You know, I was thinking about that. You know, I could give the 
oh, I think this book, that's a good self-help book, you know, is, is a good <laughs> yeah. resource. But for me, and it's, I think it's just more my, my nature and everyone's different. I like some pure escapism. Oh, yeah. Um, but when I read, you know, and it, it just helps me now. Is it necessarily the best resource for, for work? In some ways, yes, because I do find correlations. Lately, and I, I'm an avid reader, which you don't know that at all. Uh, probably one of my favorite books, and it's one that they made a movie of. And this kind of goes to show, I guess, it's just kind of a different. It was um, the book was entitled, or the series is, uh, well, the book is Master and Commander, and oh. uh, O'Brien is the author's mm -hmm. name. I think Patrick O'Brien, yeah. I believe. And that yeah. series was like eighteen book series, and it oh takes gosh. place. Oh yeah, it takes place during like the Napoleonic Wars, and it's like from yeah seventeen ninety between England, obviously, and France. Yeah, from seven ninety something to eighteen fifteen, I think. And I read those books a long time ago, and, and they were I found them uh, very interesting. And I like reading books actually from that time period, and, and really where it, it relates is, you know, they do have the leadership aspect. You know, you have the captain of the ship. I'm you know, it's a department head. I'm not a captain. You know, let me be clear on that. But there's some parallels from the standpoint where, you know, everyone looks to you. In the end, everyone looks to you for the answer. And even as an extension specialist, it was the same way. You know, the farmer who may have been doing, you know, been a grower for 20 plus years or uh, the service tech who may, you know, has some good a bit of experience, maybe as much. You know, they're looking to me, someone because I have that degree, saying, hey, you're the brand new extension specialist or you're the brand new department head. you got to have the answer. And reading those books, you know, because they do talk about the anxiety of making decisions. Or, and and it's just, it's, I just find, I find it interesting because I, I could relate to some level and it's like, I do got to make the decision or, um, you know, you lose a little face, I guess. So. Um, it, it, it sometimes, well, it, it's overly simplistic, my answer there, because, you know, you can't be, you know, asked for input and whatnot. And it, they do have those. In book. I, I just found them interesting. Good yeah, no, I, I think that's great. Um, I had a, a college friend and roommate. We were obsessed with the Lord of the Rings. So we read all those books and <laughs> it's a great escape from daily life. <laughs> yeah. Well, Lord of the Rings, um, I've read a few times. I mean, I've read a lot. Heck yeah. I mean, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not just saying that. I've read a lot. Yeah. No, yeah, you had to pick a favorite, so I get it. Um, yeah, we were obsessed. And then the movies came out when we were undergrad, so we were obsessed with the movies. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, another good book, if you want Lord of the Rings, but of science fiction, is Dune by Frank oh. Herbert. Herbert. And they had the, the I have not read movies. those yet. The first one is a definite. It's a it's it's a dense book, meaning it's sometimes hard to follow because it's like like yeah. Lord of the Rings. It's like so much backstory. Yeah. It's like where are we going with this? But it's really good. And the new movie, you know, part one that came out, they did a good. They did it justice. So I mean, yeah, it's another good. book. I've awesome. Um, so the last question that I'll ask before we conclude today is: What advice would you give somebody? To be successful in poultry in general, the industry, academics, or other. Yeah, well, and, and I've already touched upon it. At least, at least from my experience, is to be friendly, outgoing, ask questions. Um, you know, just be um, inquisitive. You know, just show interest. And, and I'm not saying feign. You know, wow, well, no, I find that interesting, and then walk away. But actually, genuinely be interested, and if you ever have problems, you know, reach out to the people that you believe uh, would have a solution. Because most of them, like I said before, with the farmers, um, they're they're willing to help, even competitors. And, and I've seen that a lot, even in the poultry industry, where uh, you know, one company, uh, you know, personnel, maybe not officially, obviously, you know, may help someone because of that personal relationship they built up, and, and you know, that I mean, people do like helping other people, I think genuinely, which um, is most people's cases, maybe not everyone. So really my advice would just be, you know, don't be afraid to ask, uh, to reach out to someone and ask a question because, you know, what's the worst they can say, either email or phone call or, you know, just say no. Uh, on the other end, you know, you may 
get some useful information that may be beneficial to your career or your, um, uh, you know, whatever you're working on, your research or whatever. So really just, you know, reach out and talk to people, ask the question. At least that's what I try to do. Sometimes uh, we, we, we get too wrapped up in our, not necessarily ourselves, but we get too wrapped up in, um, no one really wants to look foolish, right? So they may be afraid to ask the question, uh, but you really shouldn't. I mean, that's a, even myself as a 50 year old, I got to sometimes overcome, uh, but you know, that's just part of it. Just don't yeah, be afraid. I, to ask I think it's, yeah, it's good. We, uh, I always tell my students, I teach a poultry class in the fall, and I, I just started ours this fall, and I said, it doesn't really matter what you look like when you're handling birds, because they're always going to make you look silly. They're going to find a way to escape or or whatever. And so the one of the first roosters that I picked up yesterday, I was telling them about beak treatments, and then the little guy bit me on the arm, and I said, well, here we go. <laughs> So always an opportunity with chickens for them to make you look silly. So it was, it was oh, pretty God, funny. So I said, well, silly. that hurt. That hurt a little bit. So we'll move on. <laughs> I said, don't pick that one up. He's kind of mean. So, <laughs> Well, thank you for your time today. This was really interesting. I, I think you have a really interesting career path and all the stuff that you've worked on. The extension part is so important because getting the information at the university out and working directly with Producers is why why we're all here trying to make the industry better. So thank you for your time. Th thank you. I, I appreciate you reaching out to me and having me here. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome.